Hello, hello everyone, and welcome to the Games Matter event for November 21st, 2014. I am Mega Pie Man, and today we will be talking with both Paul Dana and Jim Horn from Plastic Games about their game BitShifter. How are you guys doing today? Doing great. Doing great. That's great to hear. As always, chat, feel free to chime in any questions you may have about the game, as well as the volumes. Volume is the easiest thing to fix when it comes to live streaming, so let me know if the game's too loud or too quiet, I'm too loud or too quiet, or if the developers are too loud or too quiet, and I will do the best that I can to accommodate as many people as possible. So, let's bring down the music and bring up the game. So what exactly is BitShifter? Bit Shifter is an action strategy game. It's a game where you get to fly a hover shift and you get to place and pick up and repair a robotic army that we call Bits in the fight against virus that has invaded your PC. So it's kind of Tron-like in theme. It takes place inside the computer and uh, it's a partly strategic, partly uh, action-oriented game. Um, it's kind of a combo of a space shooter and, uh, and a tactical strategy game. Uh, where you're fighting virus. Yeah, it's a pretty cool idea that you're actually... The whole game takes place not just, like, in the computer, but in a completely cyber world where all of the insides of the computer, uh, or the, the, the not, like, real hardware, but all the software, are represented by, like, buildings and towns and people and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Yeah, that was our vision for a computer. You know, if you were inside it, it would just look like a world to you. You know, but obviously uh, it's important that you keep the data stream safe. That's central to the whole world. And so that's like your primary goal. Keep that virus away from the data stream. Now, this game is currently in alpha and is actually part of Desura's alpha funding project. But you do have a Steam Greenlight campaign to get it onto Steam at the moment. That is correct. That is correct. Um, we uh, started Alpha uh, basically the beginning of this year, and we uh, got a lot of great feedback. Um, we have some videos. We talk about that. Um, but, uh, you know, basically we, uh, we found out a lot of things that were wrong with the game that were uh, just holding back some of the fun, some of the pacing, you know, as well as uh, some of the sort of the relevance of your actions in the game. We tightened it up, and we got a great reaction. Um, our last release, we just put in, uh, you know, game – controller support and uh, key binding and the ability to play as male or female. So some stuff that wasn't essential to the gameplay, but that really helps, you know, put a final polish on it. And so now we're pretty much at the end of the uh, alpha funding phase. <clears throat> Once we get a little more content done, we're going to go to beta. All right. So as I bring the game up here, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what it is you both do at Plastic Games? Okay, great. So I'm Paul, Paul Dana. I am the programmer at Plastic Games. Um, we've been working on this game Bit Shifter for a long time. It's been kind of a passion project. Uh, we generally do contract work at Plastic Games. We've worked for companies like Hasbro and Disney doing games. If you've ever been down to Disney Epcot and played that game uh, Test Track, it's like a ride that you ride on, um, they revamped that game and we did a post show game there. So, uh, you know, that's something that people may uh, have seen before. That was a lot of fun. But we also had this passion project, BitShifter, that we've been, you know, kind of on and off for years. It does, there's no funding for it. We're just making it out of our, just our own spare time. And uh, we uh, just had a tough time sort of putting it down. You know, we've been uh, sort of making it forever and realizing it wasn't good enough, refining it. And so uh, just, you know, this year we got to the point where we're like, we need to put this out there and, and finish this thing. So it looks like you've chosen uh, that Flash BIOS is female. Mm-hmm. Excellent. And you played the first level? I actually played quite a lot of this game, but I played it a while back, and I do not remember the controls. So, it'll this will be a, a bit of an interesting show we got today. Also, the game doesn't run all that great on my PC, which is a bit of a shame, since it does make it a little bit hard to play with how choppy it is, but hopefully things will hold on there for the rest of the interview as we go along with that. So, Jim, what is it that you do at uh, Plastic Games, and what impact have you had on BitShifter? Well, I started 
around 2010, 2009, in that area with plastic games. I am the 3D artist. I do some level design uh, also. Uh, I was, when I came into it, they had a, a, the, the base idea of the game, and it was going well, and I uh, just kind of upped the ante with the art, adding the buildings and adding the different type of scenery to kind of make it feel like a computer world. And that it definitely does do. You got a really cool aesthetic going with Bit Shifter, even though it's not like super what you would, what a lot of people would necessarily. Like. I mean, it, it it doesn't look like something like Crisis Three or whatever. But for what it is, it still looks really good, and it's got a very very good design behind it. But the thing that I really like about Bit Shifter is just how its mechanics work together in which you fly around as this spaceship, but you aren't just flying around as a spaceship fighting things. You also have to use your little bots to try to clean up all of this virus that is taking over, like that, that is taking over the entire place and trying to completely corrupt the whole town that you're trying to defend, as I lost <laughs> within about five seconds. So, what are some of the... It, some of the inspirations behind Bit Shifter, where all these ideas came from. Um, they actually came from a lot of different places. It was originally inspired by a very coin-op style game that I used to play way back in the day on an Atari ST called Oids. And I thought, hey, it'd be fun to make Oids in 3D. And I started to do that. That's where this funky shit idea was inspired from, right? But uh, the game turned out to not be all that fun. Just simply translating an old-school game into 3D didn't miraculously make it fun. Amazing, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew a designer at the time, a guy named Joe Marushak, who worked at Garage Games, and he suggested the premise of the game that we worked with ever since, that, you know, what if uh, these robots, what if you're inside a computer, you know, and you're, like, fighting virus? And, uh, you know, virus spread, you got to stop it. And it sounds pretty simple when you state it that way, but it's taken many years to come up with something that... Uh, you know, it's both comprehensible and, uh, you know, engaging, right? Right. The, the first game was fun if you knew how to play it, but it was, it was very hard to teach you how to play in a way that was kind of painless. So, you know, you're, you're seeing this happen now in this level. Hopefully uh, you'll stop losing and you'll start winning. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think well, he's thanks. got it. No, I'm just teasing. Hopefully it teaches you how to play while, while not boring you to tears, something that our uh, second tutorial did. The first one we won't even speak of. It was wretched. But the second one was also wretched enough. It, it taught you how to play, but you were just totally bored by the end and over-explained everything. And so this is kind of our third attempt at a tutorial system that's more in place and uh, interrupts you less, you know. Well, so far I've really liked the ideas behind BitShifter because it, in, in its essence, it's a, it's a real-time strategy game with a little bit of, like, tower defense thrown in the mix, kind of, because you do have to worry about these towers that will throw you around and the enemies that will automatically spawn in out of, out of absolutely nowhere. And you not only do you have to manage on trying to defeat enemies so that your ship doesn't die, you also have to constantly be trying to take out the virus and keep your little army of robots alive. Yeah, it's, so far we've had a great reaction, uh, but it's also... Uh tough on people's eyes you know they find they're so engaged they don't blink and they just get dry eyes so we're, we're gonna encourage people to remember to blink when you play this <laughs> it can get kind of intense um you know somebody had mentioned that they thought that this was uh the first uh, resource management game or micromanagement game i guess was the term they used the first micromanagement game they'd ever played and you know, we didn't really think of it in that terms. We didn't realize that uh, that's what we were making, but it, it kind of is. You know, you really have to keep your eye on everything. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very much about managing everything that's happening on and off the screen at the exact same time. Because just like with, with, with this level, it happened a little bit earlier. When I first started this level, I came over here to deal with the virus over here, and I forgot about this virus over here. So you have multiple points that you constantly have to be aware of because there are multiple points of failure within the, with the whole full level. Yep, and uh, hopefully this, you know, the little circuits that you see there that, you know, you can see the circuits of the world that, uh, you know, hopefully it's kind of clear what's going on there, that the virus spreads more quickly down those circuits, and if the circuits lead back to the data stream and it, the virus gets there, then you lose. So there's some priority you have to put in. you got to make sure you sort of beat it the right way, right? Um, also, you'll notice, look at some of these circuits here are uh, gray. They don't have any power. So right now that doesn't really uh, matter because it's just connected to one of those little Teslas there. Mm. So 
but if it was connected to like a bomb maker back there, it would stop making bombs. Right? So right. this one luckily this one has power so you're good, but at the beginning this wasn't making bombs. You may not have noticed that, you know. Yeah, you first um, you can actually capture the towers throughout the game, and some of them you can actually pick what they make. So they either make like health packs, or they make bombs, or they make shields and different kind of power ups, which adds a lot of strategy to the mix. Yeah, that was one of the later things that we did after uh, you know we our release on Desura. We like I said, we got a lot of great feedback from people, and uh, you know one of the things that they had said was, you know, you're connecting collecting these coins here. And uh, they're like, well, okay, it, it unlocks a little bit of lore. You get to read a little bit. But that's kind of unexciting. I feel like I spent all this time diligently collecting coins. There's nothing to do with them. Same thing with the golden coins. It didn't really give you much. So the uh, you've gotten far enough in the game to see that you can spend those coins to, to choose how to how to d determine what comes out of these makers. So you can, am I going to get a bomb or am I going to get like a turret for defending my guys? There's lots of different choices. Hey, good job. You did it. Yeah. Nice. You can also use the uh, coins to upgrade your ship, if I remember correctly. Those are the gold coins, yeah. And so the, the the gold coins give you a chance to level up, and when you level up, you get to choose the ability to, uh, of your ship. And these were some features that we put in very late in the game, but um, have really uh, increased uh, engagement. You know, people are, are really more invested in it, and they, they really like it a lot that they that they get to upgrade their ship, and that you know, choosing the coins is is not just sort of a task. Now there's a purpose to it, and everything. Mm -hmm. So. So like we mentioned, oh, I'm sorry, the game's just a little bit uh, talky. We gotta cut some of that text. Yeah, so far it's not it's not too bad. It's um, I'm just I just need to remember that you can actually skip the text by pressing uh, the space bar. Yep. Right now we're only allowing you to do that if you've lost the game and you're coming back through it again. We're probably just gonna let you skip it forever. You don't you don't need to read in it. Uh, there's very little that uh, you have to read in the bubbles. And uh, we could just, you know, not give you the, uh, the ability to skip that. So we're thinking, we're trying to help. There's still some refinements we've heard from some people about ways we can make this better, and you know, we intend on moving on those. So we're not entirely done with it. You know, it's still, it still is an alpha, and there's some improvements yet to put in there. But you know, I think you can see the uh, the game, right? Right. This and level. even though the game is very early and it's kind of rough in some ways, I've still enjoyed the game a lot. It's got a lot of potential. The biggest thing that I can say that you guys probably need to work on is uh, the frame rate. No matter how much I've played this game or messed with any kind of the uh, options menu, I've always had a horrible, horrible frame rate, which is a bit of a shame. But then again, the game doesn't play super quickly, so it it's not like doesn't ruin it, but it would still be nice to have uh, something a little bit smoother. Yeah, I wonder what's going on there. Do you, is it a laptop? What kind of machine do you have? Um, I'm working on my desktop right now. Wow. All right, let's just see what's going on. They... I can send you my PC specs um, after we're done here. Yeah, we haven't seen, you know, for some people with some, uh, you know, laptops that are a little underpowered or just have, you know, onboard graphics or whatever, they're kind of old. Those have been performing poorly, but uh, desktops have generally been performing really well, so I wonder what's going on in your case. Yeah, I don't know. Hopefully we'll be able to figure out something like that. But this game, it is currently in development. What are some of the ideas that you have as you continue the development for the game in the future? We got a lot of great stuff. Um, you can see some of it in the trailer. Uh, where there's a lot of different environments that we've already made to play this game in that are different than this kind of, you know, daytime bright green edge of the city, you know, park kind of a feel. We've got, you know, mountains, we've got like snow levels, we've got, you know, desert with like uh, pyramids and, you know, just canyons, just cool stuff. we got a lot of cool stuff for, for environments that are already worked out. And um, there's also some, uh, a lot of different sort of abilities. You, you've seen a little bit of the... Uh, um, the items that come out of the uh, makers here and later on in the game you talked about how you get to choose what these makers will make you get a blank one with a question mark on it and you get to choose and spend your coins on what you want to get as you level up you get more and more choices in that list so you may have noticed that you start to get a cleaner bomb that you can throw down that'll clean a circular area that's really critical for the, the levels later on that are more frenetic and that you know there's just a lot of threat coming in it's really helpful there's a uh, uh, you can deploy turrets you know, as an option, or you can get one of these plasma bombs that you can see here. It starts upgrading the plasma bomb and making it stronger. So we've got a lot of stuff like that planned for it. And uh, there's also just some fun mechanics that uh, 
you know, I don't want to uh, really talk about now because they're, uh, you know, boss mechanics, right? Mm. So, spoiler. Did you get to play through to the boss level? I think the boss level is where I stopped. It's been a while since I actually got a chance to play Bit Shifters, so I don't exactly remember where it was that I stopped playing the game, but I got pretty far through the first area, if not completely through the first area. Okay. But yeah, the game definitely does branch out quite a lot, and one of my favorite levels I've played so far is some level that's like during a thunderstorm or something, which is a rather large level and is a very, very difficult level. So there's yeah, a lot yeah. of challenge when it comes to actually managing everything in the game. Yeah, that is a toughie. That's, that's a tough one. That's probably the hardest level in, in, the, in the series is that one. We had fun time with that, so... How many areas are there actually in BitShifter at the moment, and do you plan on adding more? Um, yeah, we're definitely adding more. So we tried to focus on, you know, just getting the game right and really having, you know, the first set of levels, you know, uh, tell a whole story, you know, through the beginning through a boss level and just sort of take you, give you a microcosm of the game. Um, so there's 11 levels. BitShifter goes to 11, man. There's A1 through A11. And 11 is the uh, boss level. And there's a plan for uh, several more systems. After we have B system ready, we're going to go into beta. Uh, you know, so that's that's going to be pretty soon. We're working on those levels now. And, uh, you know, at that point, we'll be ready to publish whoever will take us. If we get greenlit, then we'll be on Steam at that point, you know, wherever that uh, we can sell it. And um, then, uh, yeah, there's plans for a whole lot more. Uh, there's... Uh, each system, A, B, C, D, will end with a boss battle. Uh, in B, there's going to be a new enemy that we're working on. This should be a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, uh, there's also uh, plans for uh, map editing. We hope to have that out by the, the, the final release anyway. You know, once we... once We're not really going to be comfortable saying that we're out of beta and the game's really done until uh, user-created content, level editing is in, mm -hmm. and uh, online co-op play. So that's something that's been planned from the very beginning. It's always always was a co-op game. Had to take it out in order to just get as far as we got. But we have every uh, every intent of putting that back in. You know, yeah, we well just as... got a uh, just got a question in chat from Sketch who was asking if there was going to be any kind of online multiplayer uh, functionality. Yeah, this is definitely co-op, which is going to be uh, very easy to achieve because it's just multiple players in this world. So that you know that it's very little to work out there. We definitely hope to have that working soon. Um, we'd also would love to do player versus player online, but we've heard so many awesome ideas from people about how that might go. You know, like maybe each team has its own virus color and they throw it on each other. <clears throat> oh. So many different ways we can go there. So that's something that's definitely going to come in a later patch. And I'm, I don't know if that's going to be included in the first, you know, game at release time, but it'll certainly be something that'll come out uh, post-release in like the first patch or whatever. So... So you definitely have a lot of plans for BitShifter in the future. How many people are there at Plastic Games? So there's uh, there's five of us who are like the, the core uh, developers at Plastic Games. And we've got uh, a couple people who do work with us. Uh, one is uh, Aldo, who does the awesome music for the game. Um, he's, uh, you know, he does other stuff besides, you know, do uh, music for BitShifter, but we're, you know, happy to have him. And, uh... We have various forms of help, but yeah, there's there's five people at the core of it. All right. Um, if anybody has any questions in chat, feel free to post them there, and I will do the best that I can to relay them to the developers so that we can try to get your questions answered. But yeah, I've really been enjoying my time with the game, and I'm glad to see that you guys uh, were interested in partaking in this interview, because there's been a lot, there's a lot of places that you could really go with BitShifter, and it's interesting to hear that you've been working on it for like 13 some years or so. I mean, that's, that's kind of ridiculous. It is kind of ridiculous. 13 years ago is when I said, I was just working on my own, and I said, I'll make OIDs in 3D. It was a couple years later that I met, uh, you know, two guys, Jason and, uh, you know, Kirk, who did some 3D and 2D art and animation and stuff and helped make the core of the game and everything. And, uh, you know, we just, 
We never really got funding for it. We never got anybody interested enough to pay for it. So we always had to just work on it in our spare time. And it's amazing how little you get done when you're working on things in your spare time. <laughs> but we never gave up. And we love this game. We totally believe in it. We think it's, you know, the basis of just a great game. And we want to see that game happen. You know, we're, we're definitely very passionate about it. And we believe in it 100%. Um, you know, this is this is all just an experiment to see whether other people agree, you know. Mm -hmm. We uh, we get greenlit and we're able to, to go to Beta and to Sura and start selling this and making some money. You know, we can continue to do it and actually ship the game. It'll be awesome. So, uh, you know, any help that we can get from anybody. We don't even know what's going on with uh, Steam and Greenlight. We hear all kinds of things, like it's going away, and we have no idea what it's going to be replaced with, so. Yeah, it's kind of up in the air as to what's going on with that kind of stuff. You never really know what's happening because of how people have found ways to sort of... Defender 3D. Awesome. I, I didn't know about Defender 3D. Defender is like, uh, I used to play tons of that at coin op, so I never knew it was really made in 3D. That's crazy. I can't really imagine a game like that in 3D, actually. Yeah, but, just... yeah no one really knows what's, where Steam's going. It's interesting to hear you say that, or that, to see that this game first <laughs> went to um, the Sora Alpha funding, because what I've heard of the Sora Alpha funding is that it doesn't really have a lot of point because not a lot of people really follow it like they do something on steam have you had oh, much yeah, success graveyard. with apple funding yeah we have not we, we did not have a whole lot of success with it um you know we really didn't expect to sell a lot of copies of the game but we kind of hoped that once we had a you know free demo we'd get a little bit more engagement from the uh, community and you know that's happened a little bit but uh it hasn't happened as much as we had hoped. We'd hoped that we would get a lot more people who were interested in playing. Maybe it hurt us to not have a, a free demo upon first release. You know, we probably should have done that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's certainly the, the feedback that we got was certainly helpful. You know, we definitely improved the game. So what, what price is this game at right now? And do you have any plans on actually in, um, changing that price? Or is it going to stay about that throughout the rest of the development? Um, we are planned. Uh, the price right now is three ninety nine, so it's basically four bucks. Uh oh. Um, and uh, yeah, we we plan on increasing that as uh, as we go into beta and we get to release. Um, but uh, not by a whole lot. It's not going to be an expensive game. You know, we we see this as uh, you know, this is like a, a simple, fun kind of game you can get into and play real quick. We don't see this as something that you're paying a whole lot of money for. You know, we think the final price is. You know, going to be ten dollars, fifteen dollars. So, you know, when we get to to beta, we might go up to six or seven dollars from where we are now. Mm -hmm. It all depends on how we think, uh, you know, what we think the value is for what you're getting, right? Maybe until you get more maps, we won't go uh, raise the price that much. We may keep it the same and just raise it on release. Kind of depends on the timing of uh, getting greenlit and stuff, right? Well, I'm definitely glad to hear that you guys are actually working on getting some sort of map or a level creator in the mix if you do actually get on the green light or just as the game develops because uh, that's really one of the best ways to try to make a community it's worked for something like tf2 i can definitely say that the, one of the only reasons why T team fortress 2 is still as popular as it is is due to the fact that it's got a really large mapping community so a game like this i could see a lot of people trying to work on a lot of different maps coming together and there's actually a couple different game modes in the game as, as it sits you have this game mode here where you're just trying to defend the data stream for getting completely taken over by the virus and then there's the game mode where you're just going around trying to collect as much stuff as you can within a certain period of time do you have plans on any other kinds of game modes you talked a little bit about co-op but anything other than that oh absolutely so <clears throat> the uh the coin collection is our first type of bonus round and you're right that breaks up the the play it makes it a little more fun where you're just spending time trying to collect as many coins and that's helpful because then you need the coins you know when you play this style map and you need to program your makers to get what you want um and there's plans for other types of uh, bonus play. We're going to have like a survival mode where you just have to stay alive for a certain amount of time. You know, there's just stuff everywhere. Um, we're going to have maybe a mode where you have to save bits, move them from one side of the map to the other, you know? Mm -hmm. So you're, you're moving bits, but they're not cleaning anything up. It's just a matter of how many in a certain time period can you get to, to have them survive and stuff. Most of the, the really fun variations on the game mode are going to come from uh, probably the player versus player online multiplayer because we're really going to likely to mix it up a lot there um this game works okay for a co-op game uh you know for player helping each other out 
uh, one thing that's not easy to see, you know, you, you're really close to the Scandis, so he, he looks kind of big and you see what you're doing, but the Scandis is actually really small. If you hit the uh, Q key to fly down there, you'll just you'll see that you're as big as one hexagon on the ground. You're this tiny thing. Wow, that's so when you're really playing, cool. Yeah, so when you're when you're flying around with other people, it's just this tiny dot on the horizon you got to play by, uh, you know, um, by your instruments almost. And so I don't think that's going to make the most satisfying player versus player experience where you're really going to want to shoot people out of the sky. So we're almost certainly going to have to introduce new vehicle types when we do that <laughs> multiplayer. And so that'll be really interesting, right? And uh, we've heard so many fun ideas that people had about how that multiplayer could go, one of which would be like, teams that you know in this world they have to train and so there's like kind of like a safe kind of virus that you throw down that's not red so there's a purple team versus you know blue or whatever you know purple versus yellow something and uh, you know you would you would throw virus on the other team kind of like a capture the flag where the offensive would be about trying to infect their data stream and you know the uh, defensive would be holding people off and then there's also kind of like more of the left for dead style where one play one player plays the virus and the other people play you know not so and there's there's a flying vehicle that later on in the game there's like these flowers that spawn, and uh, if you let them ripen and open, they spit out a flying ship that attacks you. So there's also flying enemies in this game. So uh, there's opportunities to have the multiplayer. You can fly one of those guys. So really, quite a lot of opportunities here for uh, developing this game. Um, we would love to have some days, you know, mods. The, the engine is moddable, so it, it wouldn't be crazy for people to also be able to make different game styles and different gameplays. So. You know, that's another thing that we would definitely consider, uh, you know, post-launch, just like multiplayer, uh, player versus player. A lot of room for development there. Ooh, you almost, you almost, oh, you just saved it in time. I know, that was really <laughs> close. Oh, that was bad. But this, level is br this level is brutal, is it not? Yeah, there's everything everywhere all over the place. But thankfully, it's actually pretty open, as opposed to some of the levels which are in a city and a lot of really, really small space. Right. You like, didn't complain when the bombs went off, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've got to pay attention to what's going on there. And it's, uh, I really do like how the, the game, it's not just you have to deal with what's going on. There's actually more virus that'll show up as you go throughout the map. So the game's actually pretty dynamic in how it changed things up. But you mentioned that um, the engine that you're working with is moddable. What engine did you guys decide to go with for bit shifters? Uh, we hard, It wasn't a choice that was uh, hard to make because there wasn't a lot of choices at the time. Um, this is an ancient game engine. This is the same game engine that drives Tribes 2. So this is the Torque game engine. Not even the most latest one, Torque 3D. I've been working with this same old game engine for, for years. Um, that's helped for some things and made other things really hard, as you might imagine. But, uh, you know, our focus has been on this gameplay and trying to get an engaging experience. We haven't been worried about, you know, fighting the big guys on graphics because let's be honest we're not going to beat them at it you know we don't have a million dollar budget to show you slick graphics we, we have to go with this kind of retro simplified look it's the best we could do and the game engine's pretty good at that we spend a lot of time modifying the game, game engine to make it easy to make these maps and that's why the, you know having a level editor that people could play is is, is uh, a possibility in fact it's really fun to make these maps it's also kind of a, a little intellectual challenge on its own because you can imagine you know, there's a lot here, right? There's paths that are all connected. There's virus spawns in certain locations. So there's a lot of technical details about how all that works out. But it's very satisfying because it, you can make a map very quickly. You know, we've focused on the goals to, you know, to be able to just play stuff down and try it out really quickly. Quick iteration has been sort of critical. So, you know, we think people will really, uh, they'll find that pretty groovy. It's, it's, it is definitely a lot of fun. You know? Yeah, and that definitely be good if you get on to Steam, Steam for the Steam Workshop. Oh, yeah, it would be great. I've, I've been having a blast. Um, you know, my son is at college now, and so we love playing online co-op games that we can still play together, even though we're separated by distance, right? So we've been playing a lot of Left 4 Dead 2, and, uh, you know, obviously you quickly run through all the standard maps, and it's been a blast playing mods and maps that people have made for Left 4 Dead 2. There's been some amazing stuff. You know? People people go absolutely nuts with that. And yeah, it was, I, it was I've done great. a little bit of mapping in Source, but the stuff that they're able to pull off is absolutely ridiculous. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I, I I think it's and it's fun. It's it's great. I've seen some videos of people making maps in Left 4 Dead 2, and it seems like Valve definitely did the same thing. They focused on making it easy to iterate and try stuff out really quickly. You know. 
We have a question we here a in chat from Sketch who asks, with the level editor, do you plan on providing a tool set, making it easy, or will it be more complex? So I guess what he's asking is, will it be like the same kind of complex level editor that you guys use to make the levels, or will it be something that, that's dumbed down a little bit and simplified a little bit more? Um, we really haven't made that choice. We're, we're thinking it's going to be complex, and so we'll just let people use the tools. Um, we've done a pretty good job of making it so that, um, you know, as long as you're not overwhelmed by choices that you're not using, there's a core set of features you can use to make things that should uh, make people happy when they start, and then they could learn some of the complexities. Um, Paul has done know, just... a great. Go ahead. Paul Jim has done I... a great, great job at making it artist friendly. If you don't know a whole lot about programming, but you know some of the 3D tools, we've made shortcuts and certain things to make it easier to just physically map the level and then just go in and play test with just base settings. And then there's, there's menus and stuff that you can go through that will tweak said things. So programming wise, it's not as, you don't, you don't have to know a whole lot about it, but Paul can go into that part of it. Yeah, there's, 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 it's made very uh, visual, so everything that happens when you level edit, like how does the virus know to, where to, to go at the beginning of the level? You start off and the virus is already spread to some areas. How is that controlled? Um, that's visual. It's not like some number you have to know somewhere to get. There's a physical object on the ground that you can see is somehow blocking the virus, right? And areas that you want to have virus start on, you paint on the ground like a terrain texture, and you can see that there's virus there, that it's red. So you know that when the game starts, that, that will be there. And then it just spreads the way you'd expect, down the paths and moves everywhere until you put another, an object that, that stops it, that blocks it. So the process is very visual and, and is you know, kind of a, easy to understand once you know it. But it is kind of complex. It's definitely going to take some videos for people to follow to you know, go through the tutorial. That being said, we've made everything else as easy as possible in terms of like having uh, prefabs. So you can just bring in a whole section of circuit that already shows a certain pattern and just throw it down. And a lot of stuff is generated automatically. So you throw down these little uh, nodes and you connect them with lines to say where all these Zor paths are going to go. But actually, the paths just get laid down for you. Same thing for this trim on the river. You, you put down these sort of fence posts, we call them, and it generates the fence for you. So we, we're hoping that this is something that uh, you know will be easy enough out of the box that people can use it. But it's certainly not like Minecraft or something where mm -hmm. You're kind of any any player could do it. You, this is definitely mappers make maps, you know. So, have you thought about moving over to a different engine? Since you were mentioning that you are working off the Torque engine, which is a pretty old engine, and if you're going to be working on moving this game over to beta, have you thought of moving to something like possibly Unity? I've heard since it's it's very easy to port with that kind of a engine. It's it's a bit more up to date. Yeah, we've, we've done a lot of talk about that. There's been a lot of interest in getting us on Unity just because Unity is a, a gateway to so many other platforms. And, uh, you know, we're, we're thinking about it. But uh, the truth is that it's really hard to change a game engine. You know, uh, to say something like it's easy to move game engines is never really a true statement. It would be certainly a lot easier for us to move to the more modern version of this game engine that it has a, a you know, MIT license, so it's, you know, open source in every way. Mm -hmm. But... Um, but it, one problem with that is that you know one of the things we, I started with was uh, you know a gateway to uh, Macintosh and Linux uh, with this game engine, and they dropped support for that in the in the latest game engine. So it would be going backwards in that way, right? I would it, you know I would be gaining a more modern graphics, but I would be losing out on port hello inbox and more and more people using Linux these days. I I think that's kind of a good thing. You know, however, there's an awful lot we can do to try to improve the graphics and, you know, make this game more interesting. There really isn't any shaders in the game, and that could be added and stuff. So, you know, um, the basic answer is no. We don't, we're not really thinking about moving to another engine because we think that would be kind of folly. You know, we want to finish the game. We think people would like to play this game. So, And people don't really care what game engine things are on, you know? I mean, I don't think people do. They, they certainly would say, hey, can I play this on, you know, uh, a Wii U, right? They might want to know that and you know maybe unity would be a way for us to get there that would be hard to get here from this engine so that kind of thing is true this map is hard isn't it yeah um i <laughs> it's a lot of places to to follow but that does bring up the question have you guys thought about putting the game on anything besides i know it's currently out on windows i don't know if it, you were saying that it's, it's out on like linux or whatever have you thought about putting it out for other things like mac or even out for consoles 
Yeah, we think it'd be a great fit for consoles. Like I said before, there's full console support for navigating the menus and stuff. So, you know, we're ready to be, you know, full screen experience on Steam when we get there. And uh, absolutely, I think this would be great on, like, all consoles. I don't think this game works very well on uh, any kind of mobile device or whatever because it's very controller-centric. You know, you're flying around and you got to have a lot of skill. I just don't think it would translate very well. But I think it would play great on a console. I think it would be awesome. Um, you know, the, one thing that is interesting as well about the old Torque game engine that this is based on is that game engine was ported to the Xbox and to the uh, Nintendo Wii. And I think there was a PlayStation 3 port somewhere. So it, it actually is quite portable. There's a platform layer that you have to just move to get it on another device. So even though the game engine is old, that doesn't actually hinder its portability to other platforms. It just hinders our ability to deliver on like more modern graphics, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, that's good to hear. Uh, does it currently have any kind of controller support? I haven't tried it with a controller. Currently, I've only been playing with a keyboard and mouse. Um, but does it have, like, oh, these towers are really starting to get on my nerves. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, there's full, oh, there's full, man. full controller support right now. Um, the only thing that's really missing is, uh, rumble, you know, so, it, so when you get hit, there's no, like, rumble, which I'd like to add to it, but otherwise you can, you know, the game is playable, the controls, I guess, Jim, you're our big, uh, game controller player, so we base these control scheme off of kind of how Halo vehicles work and, you know, other games that you play yeah, other first-person shooter games where the controller just felt right, like Halo for once, just kind of trying to mimic those while making it fit with our game with certain modifications to make it all go. Right, and there's a sensitivity control for the stick, so how fast yeah. it spins and turns, you can tweak for your, uh, you know, your, uh, your preference, just like there is for the mouse and stuff. I always end up turning mine up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, absolutely. All right, that's good to hear. I can definitely see this game working pretty well on a controller. Um, like I said, I, I have a controller. I just I just haven't tested it out with one, so I can't say off of my, my personal experience whether it is uh, good with one or not. Okay. This level yeah, this... is kind you... of throwing me for a loop because I did really good the first time, and then I lost, and now I don't know what I did the first time to be doing well. Get that right there. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> And then you want to you want to go for the there's still part in the center there that's going to hit the river. You want to kind of go right where you're yeah. pointing. Oh, wanna, that's it right there. Wanna, no, 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 not okay. there. No, not there. You want to go up into the right. Up, up into the right. right. You're gonna get zapped though. You're gonna get zapped. Gonna get zapped. That See zapping those? is really annoying. See that if you go in the center, you can. There's right there. We're just infected. You want to kind of place right in the center, going to the river there. Oh, right here. Yeah, yeah. right there. Yeah, right. I need to make sure I don't die here. But you guys did a really good job of making me not want to go near any of those towers because it is such a pain to get thrown around like that. <laughs> Paul, should we do a spoiler alert? <laughs> no, I don't think so. We should okay. probably just tell them, hey, right. you know, you know this, this, this level is hard. Everyone has trouble with it, so we'll just make you feel better by saying it. it, I, it I like it a lot because it um it it's it's a lot of challenge. It's really where the game starts bring up a lot of challenge. From what I remember when I played this before, I didn't find a lot of the early levels to really be much of a challenge at all. I was able to breeze through them, but I remember this level. I remember this level being a pain because <laughs> you kind of hit a, a a brick wall for a little yeah, bit. Yeah, this is. This is tough. It's it's at night, so it's harder to see. There's a lot of these zappers that are just a pain in the, in the touche, and you've got multiple threats here. There's like three different places that it's going to get you. So it's you know, we're, we're not, just, I don't know what we're thinking. We're just evil. Sometimes we're evil people. We apologize. <laughs> well, it works. It, it works for me. Considering the game doesn't seem to have. Oh my goodness. Oh, I'm getting thrown around like a pinball. Come on. <laughs> Considering the game doesn't seem to have difficulty settings, having a bit, having just the challenge it ramp does. up as you go, it does have difficulty uh, settings. Yeah, actually, it's it's kind of interesting that way. We have uh, kind of a unique situation. We have two difficulty settings below normal. I don't know if I've ever seen that anywhere before. So, whoa, that's just crazy. I exploded. <laughs> We're not going to talk about that. Okay, right. that was like pieces. <laughs> uh, thankfully, though... Later. When you explode, um, that doesn't actually completely end the game. If you end up dying, Ooh, you right can there, right there. just come there right back. Go. Nice save. 
Nice save, yeah. You know, nice use of the cleaner don't, bomb there. Don't forget to get the little patches. Those little patches be can become big again. Yeah, it's the main thing to keep in mind. You have to cover every single little piece, which is good to see that even though you have to cover every single little piece, you actually eventually get a bit of an upgrade for your ship so you can actually shoot the virus for yourself. Right. And now yeah, that, that's actually helpful. If you're about I'm going to get that right there. Yeah, there you go. I got like it. Right I got now, it. that would be helpful to like clean this area. There you oh, go. Oh, man. These things are out for blood now. Yep, and you got the cleaner bomb so you can do a, a thorough job there. There we go, that's your Nail it, there you go, see? Now you got th those ones nailed down. Your bit probably didn't survive over there where you put them, so that original bit you put down probably could use some help. Have you guys thought about adding um, different kinds of bits, like maybe some sort of a combat bit that could actually be used to defend the other ones? Hey, we, yeah, that's something that is planned for, uh, you know, further levels in the game. Um... That's kind of where we invented this whole bomb idea from, is we needed to have a, a mechanism of deployment that wasn't complicated. Because the bits the bits are interchangeable, aren't they, right? When you pick up a bit, you don't have to say which one you're putting back down. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so we are you know, we have this bomb mechanism where these makers will make these bombs. You pick it up. Bombs could potentially be anything, including different sorts of bits, exactly like you're saying, like ones that could help defend, you know, ones that could maybe heal your bits. We have a lot of ideas for, you know, it's going to be a lot of variation. So there's, there's going to be enemies in the future that are like uh, slugs, you know, and they leave virus trail behind them. But they, they spread the infection, so that's their threat, right? And there's going to be, you know, uh, bits that you can get or things that you can get that will, uh, you know, do a better job defending an area. Uh, there may even be like your own form of slug. We're not really sure what to do with it, but something that will walk the traces for you and clean up from one direction to another because the bits aren't all that smart are they you know they, they're not that strong and they're not that smart they need you so uh you know part of the game in the future is going to have items that will do a good job defending them you know, you've already got the turrets but you know they're uh we need to tweak those a little make them a little more effective they're not very good at what they do and there's going to be stronger turrets as you uh, level up and stuff so how how close to the I guess how close to the final version is the game right now? Is it is it just the very very basics of the idea, or are you basically going to ju just take what you have now and maybe throw a couple more mechanics into it, maybe throw a couple more maps into it? Um, yeah, it's it's. I think you know the, the questions that you've asked me pretty good during this interview. You get people who have been listening the whole time. Have probably heard a lot about some of the stuff that we're planning on doing. There's going to be quite a lot more to what comes next, and some of it's already built. You know, the game was kind of built in a funny way. We kept thinking we were farther along than we really were, so we've built stuff for the end that's, you know, sitting there ready and waiting, but that's, you know, we, we are not using it, right? Um, there's a very powerful virus fighting bomb coming that's already built and in-game. We've got items for it. We've tested the codes in there, but, uh, you know, we aren't as far along, for example, with, like, the uh, bosses. You know, so we have plans for that, but we haven't really made that build. So, you know, we're we're firmly at the beginning of the process of people seeing what's in this game, but uh, we hope the development is going to come together very quick because we, there's so much stuff we've already built. We've got those flying vehicles that attack you, and the flowers they come from. We have that built. You can see some of that in our, uh, our trailer, you know, for the game. Um, we've got some other some some new weapons made, but they're uh, kind of weak. So we really got to work on our weapons and make them better. And, uh, you know, we've got some uh, new enemies uh, planned that, you know, I think it'd be best not to talk about them just so that we can uh, you know, have some more stuff to talk about later when we're further along, you know? So I don't know if BitShifters is necessarily far enough along to really ask this kind of question, but do you have any plans of what to do after BitShifters? You mentioned that you guys have done a lot of contract work before it, but if it did shifters takes off or doesn't take off, do you plan on going back to do more contract work, or do you plan on fletching out uh, multiple games in the bit shifters world, or is it just way, way too early to ask that kind of question? We're going to Disney World. <laughs> I like that. I like that answer. That's a good answer. Well, it's totally honest, because Jim has never played the game that we worked on for Disney, you know, from back in 2010. You know, he worked on it, finished it, did all that great work and everything. I've been there because I was there installing the game. He's never been. Yeah. So we're going to go play our own freaking game. Had, I've though. had family members and friends that have gone and seen it, and I haven't yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I hopefully, um, well, it's something to look forward to. Yes. Oh, hell yeah.
Hell yeah. And, you know, we, we actually are planning on working on BitShifter for a while. We think that, you know, there's a good model for, it's a great time to be an indie, to be honest. You know, there's a lot of great opportunities out there. And, you know, we've seen people try to sell games lots of ways. And we're, we're frankly as disgusted as all the rest of you are at the whole freemium and free-to-play stuff. We just think it's just terrible. It hasn't worked out well, and it, it's hard to do right. You know, we think, mm -hmm. hey, you know, this kind of game that we're making, we know how to make this game. You know, we think. I mean, it's been years. I right? mean, we're fooling ourselves still. We think we know how to make this. But how to try to make this a, an engaging freemium game without destroying the design? We have no idea how to do that. So, you know, our model is simple. We're going to have a fairly cheap price, but it's just one price. And we're not going to abandon the game. After it comes out, we're going to continue to add features and levels. You know, we're, we're going to be working on this for a couple years to come. So it's too early to think about what's beyond it. But what's beyond it is more bid shifter. I mean, there's so much we can do with this game. We think that if it actually becomes interesting, people are going to want that. You know, give us our multiplayer, right? Give yeah, us our player yeah. versus player. You know, that's that's where we're going with it. Um, you know, and uh, is, there's always like Bit Shifter 2. If people are really into juicier graphics and whatever, you know, it's all a matter of getting some funding. We'd be we would love to do that. You know, it'd be great to get some more resources and be able to, you know, amp up the the look of the game and stuff, or you know, move it to other platforms and stuff. We're, we're more interested in getting on different platforms and getting different languages like French and you know Spanish and all kinds of, uh, you know, just get it in the hands of more people, really, you know? Well, you've mentioned funding a couple of times. Have you ever thought about putting together some kind of a Kickstarter? Yeah, we have. Um, you know, it just it becomes so difficult, doesn't it, right? I mean, the reality of making games is that you can't just make a great game and expect people to show up. You have to do marketing and development, and we're just starting all that, you know? Yay! Woo! Awesome. awesome. Victory! I think par is like seven minutes thirty seconds. Or I think you almost got par. A little oh, bit I, I, I got it. I didn't even notice that 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 that, that it's got like par times in it too. Yeah, mm -hmm. do the next level. It's way different. This one's really hard, and we we just sort of give you something different to do next. All right, we'll check out the next level here quick. I think this is oh, this is the downtown city level. Now, this level I've had some issues with because I've had enemies spawn inside a building to the point that I can't shoot them. <laughs> And I've also been able, if this is the one I think of it, it's got those electronic fences that go around the sides. And I've, yeah. I, uh, oh, sorry about that. I've yeah, got it's... stuck between, I uh, got stuck behind a building in between electronic fence to the point that I just couldn't get out of it, which is not necessarily the greatest thing, but this level's also really cool because it's a lot bigger than any of the other previous levels. Yeah, and there's actually no, uh, you're not on the clock now, so you can kind of decide how you want to deal with this. Because it's not like, oh my god, I keep losing, it's hitting the river, right? The data stream is far away now. Mm -hmm. So it has a kind of a different feel to it as well. We call this a dungeon or a maze level, you know? And it, it doesn't break the gameplay up quite as much as the bonus levels, but it breaks it up kind of a bit, you know? Right. So this is probably our weakest level in terms of, you know, these levels we've been working on them forever, and so we got a lot... To, that had been play tested many times and refined many times. This one has not really got a lot of play testing and refinement, so it, it's got the most performance issues and you know some of the like fly through fences and stuff. Mm -hmm. This plane needs to be solved. So. Yeah, well, that makes yeah, well, sense if you have a uh, if you, just 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 for the fact that they, it's larger, so you have a lot more things being on screen at once for when it comes to uh, performance. Yeah, that's that's obviously tougher and stuff too. Yeah. I'm sorry, I think I cut somebody off. What were you uh, going to say? Um, I've been talking a lot, Jim. You got anything you want to add? So, uh, again, I'm the programmer. <laughs> Jim is the, uh, the 3D artist. It's a 3D art and animation for the game. But he also does a lot of the level level design, and he definitely makes the uh, prettiness of all the levels, all these buildings and beautiful roads that make sense and all this stuff. He does all that great stuff. So uh, if anybody has any questions for Jim or, Jim, you want to make any comments on you know, this part of the development or whatever. Well, honestly, you've been taking the words out of my mouth. So it's been, <laughs> it's been, uh, I mean, you've been, you've been kind of hitting every single point. Um, it's, I mean, it's been really fun making these levels. Um, that's really it. I mean, it, the way you've made, the way the, the editor works and everything, it's just, it is like when you're making the level, you're designing everything all at once. You can pop right back in and play it. So it really makes it nice and fun to, uh, design where you want to go, even if you're just flying around. That's usually like one of the first things I do when I finish a level is I don't put it into play mode. I fly around. I was like, is it fun to fly around? I'm not shooting anything. 
You know, is it fun to collect the coins? Is it fun to move around and in that aspect? And then I go into, okay, now flying around and fighting. Yeah, I should mention that the uh, level editor is in game, which is kind of nice. So you, you just load the level in a in a edit mode rather than a play mode, and things look a little different. And you can, uh, you know, you have these tools where you can, uh, you know, make the world. But it's you also without having to leave that edit mode, you can just fly the ship around and you know sort of see how things feel and stuff. And you don't have to leave the game or go to another tool or whatever to then test it. And so it's pretty easy to uh, test ideas and you know rapid rapidly iterate on them and stuff. So you'd think we would have done that and, and solved these coins in the ground, but no. <laughs> you we, know what? I've new, seen that so. coin. No, I've seen that coin every single time, and you know what? They're bugs. It's stuck in the ground. Yeah. Like, I've honestly, I've thought about moving that bug for a very long time, and I just like, you know what? It's doing what a bug does. <laughs> but I still got to fix the, the code that's making these guys spawn inside the buildings where you can't kill them. That's frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, if but, it's in I mean, a building, ignore it. <laughs> what you're saying, Jim, kind of—I mean, it kind of—it kind of fits what you're going for because I mean, the the thing of your game is that it's taking place inside of a computer, and the coins you're picking up—they are bugs. So, some sort yeah. of mechanic that works around like purposeful glitches. Well, I don't necessarily know how purposeful, but glitches in general would definitely really fit uh, the aesthetic and the theme that you guys are going for. Mm, that's why one of the bonus, the the first bonus level you you uh, played, you can if you're if you have the the boost, you can go through the barrier and hit a coin that's on the outside, and there's like an achievement for that and everything. It's out of bounds. Oh, I, I remember that. That's right. That's uh, that. I was surprised to see that because I wasn't quite sure how I was going to be able to get that uh, specific coin out there, and then I just found out that I could just like go outside of the bounds for a little bit and grab it. Mm. Yeah, those, those fences are kind of fun, so we're, we're kind of having fun with that. Right, this is it. a little bit excessive here. <laughs> uh, you Go back and get your plasma bomb. Oh, wait, oh yeah, he's got it right go. there. <laughs> there. There you go. There you I go. came prepared. All right. All right. Well, I believe I opened the warp gate. So this is the first level that actually introduces these sort of warp gates that allow you to go between the different areas and... I can't say they were used all that often. Do you plan on using these more for more larger levels down the road, or do you mostly plan on having a lot of smaller levels? Um, yeah, the, the original idea with them is to, to be, you know, gateways to, to other levels that are larger and stuff. Um, I was saying before how we have different uh, environments, you know, uh, planned, and so you're going to leave the city and you're going to end up in a more pastoral world and there's canyons and you know snow levels and mountains and just some fun stuff like that and when you get there the, the levels could get bigger and it could get a lot more confusing to how you actually get to where you're going to go so these portals are a great way to just connect to different areas you know it also it also kind of gives you a, a way to, to deal with these kind of maze like maps where you can bring portals online and be able to get from place to place you know that you can't otherwise get you know so kind of a little both have you thought of having it so that, like, when you go inside of a portal, you can then pick which one you're going to go to, or are they specifically connected to other specific portals? Um, they're connected to other specific portals, but we had considered having a portal gun. Whoever thought of that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've never where heard you, of it. Yeah, where you could put down different sides of the thing, so, and, you know... They're color-based to determine which one you go to versus which one other yeah, one. Yeah, so, for example, one thing that makes the level editing nice and easy is if you just put down two green teleporters, they connect. So there's nothing else you need to do other than place it and that, that it's green, you know? So look, the, vir the virus is mutating. It's got a little shield. See that? I did see that, and I don't think I've actually seen that before. Which you did mention that you were going to add a, you had ideas for other enemies thrown in the mix besides just these weird squid guys, but I didn't uh, I didn't see that they actually had their own upgrades that they get over time, such as getting a shield or well, all I've seen so far is getting a shield. That guy's on fire, but I don't think that's an upgrade. <laughs> it's it, it is that's the pyromania upgrade. He's just crazy. <laughs> on fire. This guy's hot. No, no. <laughs> There is versions that are, uh, you've seen like yellow and orange, if you up the difficulty because it's not hard enough for you, because mm. you know, that's that's a thing, then there's red guys that are just truly kick your ass. Oh. So there, there is kind of an upgrade to the, these enemies, and these might be the guys you can't kill. Yeah, that's yeah. the guy who's stuck in the building. Yeah, see, that's a bug that's no fun, you know, that's no good. 
the shields are actually a bug that's kind of fun. It's it's supposed to be no shields at this point, and later on they're going to acquire them, but there was a bug where every now and then randomly it was always make one, and I left that bug in because it also felt the same way that Jim was saying. It just felt right, you know? It's vi it's mutating. So I just sort of, I never bothered tracing that bug down, you know? Probably less than or equal to or something, right? Well, that, that that's how you game design. Bugs become features. Right. <laughs> it's, it's probably... <laughs> well, yeah, we're certainly, you know, trying to take an, what we call an organic approach to this game. Yeah. You know, we overstepped our bounds so many times and overdesigned and did things that we had to rip out and say, okay, we're just, we don't know what we're doing. And, uh, you know, we're trying to add things back in, you know, one at a time in a way that just makes the game more engaging and fun and that, you know, sort of kind of sensible, you know, and not, uh, and not overwhelm people. But there really is quite a lot of stuff that we have planned. And like I say, a lot of it already works. One thing I alluded to before is there's a there's a thing called a pulse bomb that we're gonna make that uh, you know that uh, when you uh, throw one of these pulse bombs on uh, a virus, if there's any any virus that connects to that virus, like a whole pool of virus, it'll just travel through it like a pulse and clean the whole thing up. So instead of having like a limited area like those uh, cleaner bombs that clean in a circle, this would be much more powerful because it could clean all the virus that's connected to each other. And that's just one of four different types of bombs that we plan that all have slightly different behavior for, you know, how they travel as a pulse and clean up the virus. So it's going to get really involved, not just on the action front with different enemies and weapons and, you know, traditional action elements, but it's going to get more fun on the strategy front as well. Now you mentioned that you have taken features out for this particular this particular alpha that's available and play on adding them in later. Is is there anything that you really wanted to have in the game that you've yet to figure out any way to actually make it work? Well, there was co-op. We had to pull that early on. We so, I so wanted co-op. It's it was always in there. This game actually, you know, won an award at a show for you know best single player game, and you know people did like like the co-op aspect to it. You know, that was like, people commented over and over again how fun it was to play as a team and stuff. But, um, you know, so that's something that I'm just dying to get back into the game for sure. And we know how to do it, but it's just a matter of, all right, do, you know, do we want to have a game that nobody knows how to play, that doesn't have any levels, that has co-op? Or do we, you know, because you kind of have to prove that the game is actually fun, and, and that proved to be true. When we put it out, we, we weren't really done yet. We didn't have all the features that are in it now, and it wasn't as fun. You know, some of the early feedback we got is, it's kind of repetitive. You know, we didn't have the coin levels to break things up. You know, we didn't have, uh, you know, the something to do with the coins, like the uh, blank makers that you flash. Mm. You know, the, those elements weren't in. A lot of elements like that that we put in the leveling up on the gold coins, that all wasn't there. And so, uh, you know, it was just more bland of a game. So a lot really came together at the very end, you know. And, and that's, that's really where we've been focused. And, you know, now that we're past that, we can focus on some of these other things. Um, in terms of, you know, stuff we would love to get in, I guess, you know, the reach goals for me are just to get on as many platforms as possible. You mentioned consoles. I think this would be a great console game. So, you know, who knows what lies in front of uh, making that happen. But, you know, one step at a time, right? It's important we get this game right. It's important that we address these performance issues, right? The yeah. game is no fun unless it, it really works as advertised. And that's first for us. So, you know, that's, that's primary. In terms of stuff that we wish we had in the game, you know, I, I'd have to list co-op. You know, it's coming. You know, but uh, and another one. Somebody was asking before about mods. Is there going to be uh, you know mods for this game, like be able to mod the gameplay and stuff? And that's another thing that we would love to have in as well. It's kind of in the realm of that multiplayer stuff, where you know, like post-release work that we'll be working on, because we know we want it, but we also don't want to you know make more bugs in the game and you know not focus on what's what's core. You know, we, we're trying to do this right. All right. Well, if anybody in chat has any last questions for either Jim or um, Paul. I, apologize. I am so bad at that. I, I apologize. But if, uh, if anybody has any last questions for either Jim or Paul, feel free to post them in chat. Is there anything that you guys want to talk about that we have yet to cover? Yeah, you guys are doing a great job covering our stuff. I mean, we got a green light page. We could use some votes. Uh, if people uh, are playing the game on Deserve, it'd be great to have people leave some comments and stuff. You know, the same stuff is, uh, you know, everyone's sort of asking, right? We're, we're another indie team with a game that we just would love to get in front of people. So anything you can do to help. All right. And I will yeah. be sure to link that in chat here uh, before we completely finish the interview. And that will also be put in the description for the YouTube video. Because I will put this video up on our 
mostly brand spanking new YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash games matter. So anybody in chat can go check that out. You guys have any contacts people can use to keep track of the game? Or yourselves individually? Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, we've, we've definitely, we've got a, you know, a Twitter ch uh, uh, account, right? Plastic Games LLC. Mm -hmm. so, and we have a BitShifter uh, Facebook page. Uh, it was um, BitShifter Game, if I'm not mistaken, for Facebook. I'll, um, yeah, BitShifter Game. So Facebook.com slash BitShifter Game. There's that. Um, yep, then, of course, we've got a, got, a, got a generic um, contact email. Anybody can mail us at uh, media at PlasticGames.com. Okay. And, uh, you know, I'd also like to uh, thank Nelson and Video Games and the Bible for... Uh, hooking us up with this interview. This happened at the yeah. last minute, but it's been really great. This is our second interview. I don't know if it shows. We've kind of sucked at this. <laughs> you, guys, you guys did fine. You did fine. Well, thank you both, Jim and Paul, for talking to me today about your game, Bit Shifters, currently in development by Plastic Games, looking to get on to Steam, but currently available on Desura. Hey guys, once more, thank you in chat for watching. Be sure to keep track of Games Matter for a bunch of interesting interviews that we have lined up coming up in the future. We've got some really cool stuff that's going to be happening just about every single weekend, so if you'd like to see more interviews just like this one, feel free to hit that follow button. I've been Mega Pie Man, and I will talk to you guys later.